Hello and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series and podcast. My name is Dexter Van Zyl and I will be moderating the discussion today. We are pleased to have with us Mr. Robert Satloff, the Siegel Executive Director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He specializes on Arab-Israeli relations, political Islam, and U.S. public diplomacy. Today, he will discuss the normalization of Saudi-Israeli relations. Mr. Satloff will speak for 15 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A from the audience. If you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A button located at the bottom, bottom of your screen and type your question. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Mr. Satloff. Hello, Dexter, and hello, everyone at the Middle East Forum. I'm delighted to be able to speak with you today. Um, uh, today, we're talking about a hot-button, high-profile political issue, um, an issue I know um, is uh, on the top of the agenda or high on the agenda uh, in the Biden administration's Middle East policy, and it's a, it's a very high issue in the Israeli national security establishment. Uh, we're going to talk today about the prospects for a Saudi Israel uh, normalization, or as the Middle Easterners prefer to call it these days, an integration cooperation agreement. Um, what that means, what are the uh, prospects, and what are the obstacles to achieving uh, this breakthrough? Um, uh, for those of you who, um, uh, I'll just say at the outset, if for those of you who want to take an even deeper dive than what uh, today's discussion will allow, uh, this is the topic of a um, uh, of an in-depth report that I did a couple of months ago. You can get it at the, the website of the Washington Institute, uh, www.washingtoninstitute.org, Saudi Normalization with Israel, Domestic Transformation and U.S. Policy. And that's really what I'd like to, to begin with. Um, this is a three-way negotiation. Uh, we talk about Saudi Israel, but it's really at its core a three-way uh, um, uh, prospect between the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Israel, with the United States negotiating with each of the other parties as much as those parties are negotiating with each other. That's a very important fundamental point to understand. It is even more of a trilateral, inherently trilateral deal, if it happens, than, than any of the previous Arab-Israeli peace agreements. Um, it is more of a trilateral deal than the Egypt-Israel Accords. It is more of a trilateral deal than the Jordan-Israel Accords, and more certainly than either the, uh, the, the Oslo Accords or even the Abraham Accords, which had a, a, a vitally strong element of the U.S. role. Here, the U.S. is pivotal. Uh, point two, um, uh, not all the parties enter this with the same uh, set of priorities, eagerness, or enthusiasm. That's because for Saudi Arabia, um, one has to begin uh, with the real story, the big picture story being the issue of domestic transformation. Transformation is a big word, but in this case, it's accurate. It is the desire, the goal of transforming Saudi Arabia from a country wholly reliant on petrochemicals for its national welfare, for its wealth, for its economy, to a diversified country that is trying to prepare itself for the 22nd century. Remember, it is about any day, month, year, to have a leader, um, uh, young um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, um, the first truly generational leap in Saudi leadership history in the modern era of this country. And he um, almost surely is thinking about um, uh, not a time frame of five years, 10 years, but he's thinking of himself ruling the rest of his natural life, which could be another 50 years, taking us toward the end of the 21st century. And I think he is thinking of this massive, dramatic, fundamental transformation uh, to prepare Saudi Arabia for what is necessary to be a successful, thriving country far into the future. This is involving uh, dramatic domestic change. 
social change, cultural change, economic change. Um, you've heard, of course, of some of the changes having to do with women's role in society, but it goes far broader than just that. Uh, uh, opening up Saudi Arabia to a hope for millions of international tourists. And I'm not talking about the type that are just going to, to Mecca for the Hajj. I'm talking about the type that are coming to play golf, um, go to beaches, um, see natural wonders, real old-fashioned global tourism, and what that will do to such a to a country that is um, uh, uh, you know historically closed to these sorts of things. It will transform relations on the business level, transform relations at an intercultural, even religious level. All these issues. Um, uh, uh, will Saudi Arabia become the center of a, a regional business, stealing this away from Dubai? Will Saudi Arabia become a place where non-Muslims can have organized communal prayer, something which hasn't existed um, um, in, 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 in a very long time um, in Saudi Arabia? These are fundamental issues that the Saudis are now grappling with. It's in this context that one needs to look at the prospect for um, this U.S.-Saudi-Israel deal. And here, my view is while a deal for Saudi Arabia is useful and beneficial, it is not urgent and necessary. Um, uh, and that's a big difference. It's useful and beneficial, but not urgent and necessary. Um, uh, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, has, shall we say, a lot of fish to fry domestically. This is just one of them. It would be useful. It would be useful in terms reputationally to dramatically change the image of uh, Saudi Arabia from um, the very negative image of recent years, from the very negative image that goes back to even before 9-11, to a peacemaker, um, hand in hand with the Jewish state. It would be beneficial in terms of the security benefits, we'll talk about that in a minute, beneficial uh, technologically, economically, it's all beneficial, but it's not necessarily the top priority. Um, uh, and it's really um, uh, what the negotiation about is what benefits can be provided to Saudi Arabia by the United States and Israel to raise it up the priority ladder. And that's because it is a higher priority for Israel. Um, uh, this government, and indeed any government of Israel, would view this as the ultimate affirmation of acceptance of the Jewish state in the Arab and Muslim worlds. If the, if, um, the custodian of the two holy mosques were to certify the legitimacy, final and irrevocable, of the Jewish state in the Middle East, that would be the affirmation of Israel's um, uh, um, uh, you know, belonging. Um, it would, to many people, uh, be viewed as the end of the interstate Arab-Israel conflict, the conflict that has um, uh, that was born in 1948 with the invasion of the new state of Israel by six Arab countries. It has been whittled down over time with peace between um, with Egypt, uh, Jordan, then um, uh, UAE, Morocco, uh, Bahrain, etc. But formal peace with Saudi Arabia would bring an end to the interstate conflict. And for many people, it would relegate the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the intrastate conflict over the, the determination of control, geography, demography, west of the Jordan River. It would relegate that to a manageable um, uh, 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 problem that Israelis and Palestinians would have to sort out, but not one that many people uh, would view as, not one that would uh, infect um, Israel's broader um, station in the Middle East. And for these reasons, this is an extraordinarily high priority for this government. Um, now, why is the United States interested in this? Uh, why is Joe Biden interested? In it? And I believe that the president of the United States really does um, see this as an important policy objective. He gets the benefits to Israel. He gets the benefits, um, and I, I think down deep, he appreciates how much this would mean 
to to um, uh, for Israel to be accepted, not just by Saudi Arabia, but the Saudis. There, they have an interest if they make this deal to bring along other Arab and Muslim states to validate their own decision. Um, I think he gets what that means for Israel, but there are also important benefits to the United States that would come with this. Um, one would be in terms of um, a clear uh, delineation of the limits of the Saudi Chinese relationship. Saudi Arabia, we should remember today is a rising global um, um, actor. It has more than a trillion dollar economy. It has the fastest growth of any G20 state. Putting limits on the Saudi-China relationship, especially limits in the military and technology sphere is an important advantage for the United States. Um, uh, 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 Secondly, it would open up um, uh, a much closer relationship with um, this um, a leading OPEC producer to align America's interests and Saudi interests in the world of energy production, ensuring consistent supply, which is a major objective of the United States. And um, I also am quite sure that the administration has in its desiderata um, uh, important Saudi moves on issues of human rights, legal rights um, uh, with um, for Saudi citizens and foreigners inside Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, rights having to do with free speech, free movement, etc. cetera. Um, uh, uh, this um, is important in and of itself. And this would be important for the administration um, uh, if it wants to win the sort of votes it needs from some of the, um, uh, uh, the people on Capitol Hill who have serious concerns about Saudi Arabia. This is the context. So what is the deal that they're talking about? What is Saudi Arabia looking for from the United States? Um, Essentially, um, uh, four things, three and a half things. Um, uh, One is a U.S.-Saudi defense guarantee, preferably via treaty if it can be achieved. But if it can't be achieved with um, acquiring the 67 votes necessary for a treaty, there are second best options of um, defense agreements, memoranda of understanding that could be ratified um, and and, uh, uh, supported by um, votes of sense of of the Congress votes of both the House and the Senate that would have a lower threshold than the 67 needed for a treaty. The Saudis are looking for a firm, clear, and strong statement of American um, uh, defense support in the event of external aggression. Um, Obviously, no one defines uh, specifically who the external aggressor would be, but there is uh, a clear understanding that we're all talking about Iran. Um, What else are the Saudis looking for? The Saudis are looking for um, a a, a statutory agreement on a fast-track provision of U.S. military goods, um, unlike the current system, um, where U.S. military hardware can be held up in any one of a number of points along the way, especially by congressional um, uh, um, uh, holds. Um, the Saudis are looking for a system where once deals are made, they are implemented. Uh, third, there will be a, um, Saudis are looking for a free trade agreement with the United States. There's been mutual benefits here. There's some obstacles, but this is negotiable. And the fourth, uh, an area where Many people have some uh, some legitimate concerns. The Saudis are looking for American partnership to develop their natural uranium deposits and to develop a civilian nuclear energy program that would be useful domestically so that they can continue, so they can do two things. One, that they can be a source of, um, uh, uh, of enriched uranium for global um, uh, um, uh, uh, for global uranium supplies. There's a market out there. Very few countries can fill it. And two, they can um, um, use this to speed up the process of moving domestic consumption of energy from petrochemicals and thereby extend the life of their export market for petrochemicals. This is what they're looking for. Some of this is highly controversial. Some of this is highly um, uh, difficult politically. Um, uh, uh, and there are, you know, some in Congress who will who will say no, who will say no to a defense treaty, 
Um, um, we, we, Israel doesn't have a defense treaty. Very few countries in the world um, uh, have defense treaties with the United States. Um, uh, and there will be a lot of pushback in some quarters on a defense treaty. And, and that's why you know options short of the Japan model of a defense treaty are something I know the, the administration is also looking at. Some will, um, uh, uh, some on both ends, progressive left, hard right, will um, uh, will think twice about wanting to embrace in such a deep and clear fashion um, uh, um, a, a non-democratic um, uh, country with a um, uh, you know a questionable human rights record and issues that need to be addressed um, on, on a whole range of, of topics. Um, but the leaderships of all three countries are pursuing this. This is where we are today. I think the Biden administration is serious. Um, it is soberly looking at all these issues. Um, I think it knows what the obstacles are domestically. Um, uh, uh, and I think it is doing its best, both for American national reasons and because it rec recognizes, I think, the strategic benefits to Israel, um, that it is pursuing this. Now, a key aspect of this, and I know we're going to go to questions in just a moment, a key aspect of all of this will be, what role does the Palestinian issue play in these negotiations? Um, my view, well, just remind everyone, when the Emirates made their Abraham Accords deal, there was, of course, a Palestinian aspect to this. Um, this was a commitment by the government of Israel um, uh, um, uh, to forswear any moves toward annexation of, uh, of occupied territories for three years, a, a date which, by the way, is moving is, is coming upon us um, in just a couple of months, um, or just a month in September. Um, I'm sure that the Saudis will want, will have their own Palestinian-related desiderata. I don't think the Israelis will succeed with just um, um, uh, um, uh, recycling what they sold to the Emirates three years ago. Um, the Saudis will have both substantive and symbolic desires. Um, uh, they will want to obviously do better than the Emirates. Um, uh, um, um, I don't think um, uh, 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 um, the Saudis have a, yet a clear idea of what they're looking for, but I am quite convinced that between what the Saudis want and what the administration wants, this will be too far for the current Israeli government in its current makeup, um, with its current composition, including um, uh, Minister Ben Gavir, Minister Smotrich, and others. This will be too far for this current government to swallow. Um, uh, um, uh, this will pose a question for Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, will he break his current government? to achieve a Saudi-Israel integration cooperation agreement? Will the opposition, will Benny Gantz and or Yair Lapid support Netanyahu, either from outside the government, providing the votes to support, or from inside the government, creating a national unity government to achieve the historic um, goal of an Israel-Saudi peace, normalization, integration agreement. These are big unknowns. My instinct is probably yes, but I think there's a lot of bargaining to happen, even among Israelis, let alone Saudi Israel, U.S. Saudi, U.S. Israel. Lots of moving parts. I think there's a reasonable chance this can happen. Um, it's by no means as uh, you know, uh, a term that we we put aside um, uh, twenty years ago, by no means a slam dunk. Um, but I think there's a reasonable, more than fifty fifty chance that by the end of twenty twenty four, or at the latest by spring, by the end of twenty twenty three rather, or by the latest um, uh, the end of the first quarter of twenty twenty four, we do have this breakthrough, and this would be transformative for all the parties, Saudi Arabia, Israel, the United States, and in some respects, for Palestinians too. I'll stop there. Thank you so much.
And I think uh, an apology might be in order. In my opening, I called you Mr. Satloff, and one of the people in the question said, it's Dr. Satloff. So I apologize <laughs> no, for no, that. No, no apologies necessary. I can't write prescriptions right. or do operations, so go ahead. Okay, now one of the questions that I, I have is, what are the Saudis gonna do in reference to the Palestinians? What type of pressure are they gonna put on the Palestinians? And how effective will they be? What, what can they do? So if your if your question is what are the Saudis likely to ask on behalf of the Palestinians, no, um, no. or is what your question what are the Saudis the likely to do to ensure that yeah, the Palestinians? What, what, is, what, what is Saudi Arabia? What type of pressure is Saudi Arabia going to apply and be able to apply on the Palestinian elites uh, to basically come to grips with uh, Israel's existence and victory? What are they going to do? Well, look, I think that. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 the major pressure that Saudi Arabia has is its ability to do a deal um, uh, on its own directly. Um, they are the, uh, the independent variable. The Palestinians here are the dependent variable. Um, uh, I think what, um, uh, if the Saudis can line up, for example, um, uh, support from the Jordanians, and there the Jordanians' main interest is to ensure that the Saudis have no desire um, uh, to impinge on uh, Jordanian prerogative in Jerusalem. And I think, parenthetically, in my view, the Saudis have no interest or desire um, to impinge on Jordanian, um, uh, 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 the Jordanian role um, in holy sites in Jerusalem. Um, uh, I think for the Saudis, this would only bring headaches and no advantage. Uh, because I think the Saudis have no interest in deepening their engagement in the Palestinian issue. And any role in Jerusalem, of course, would throw them right in the middle of the Palestinian issue. Um, uh, the Saudis, I think, are perfectly happy being the custodians of um, Mosque 1 and Mosque 2. They don't need also to be custodian of Mosque 3. Um, uh, um, so as if, if the Jordanians are fully supportive, um, I think, the, I think the, the, if that's the case, um, then I think the, the the Saudis are in very good position to impose their views on Palestinians. Now they will want to to get significant benefits for Palestinians, if only to to suppress any critique that the Saudis are doing a totally separate deal with the Israelis. And th I think there are important benefits they will secure for Palestinians, both on the symbolic level, in terms of um, not just annexation, but perhaps an Israeli commitment to the idea of eventual Palestinian statehood um, uh, in some shape or form. Something um, um, two very specifics having to do with um, not just economics, but also Palestinian control of, of certain um, um, long delayed redeployed areas in the West Bank. Most Arabs do not care about the actual details of the, of the implementation of uh, the Oslo Accords. Um, most Arabs, the further away you get from, from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, are more interested in the, the symbolic issues. Um, um, and I believe that the Saudis will have that as a high priority for them. Okay. Now, Her Kerry Hildebrand, uh, or Hillebrand, excuse me, says beyond the requisite sound bites, to what extent are the Saudis actually concerned with Palestinian welfare? Is this all just, you know, symbolic or is there any real legitimate concern on their behalf? So look, I, I, I think um, I think it's important to uh, um, uh, uh, not to be crass or um, uh, dismissive about this. Um, uh, uh, Arabs all over the Middle East do have an interest in the welfare of Palestinians. Um, uh, they may not wake up in the morning and care, you know, who governs Janin, who governs Nablus, but there is a, a human connection that does animate um, people around the Middle East, including in Saudi Arabia. There is deep disdain for the Palestinian leadership, which um, is widely viewed as, as feckless, corrupt, um, uh, et cetera, co uh, continually missing the boat on Israeli offers of um, um, eminently reasonable uh, political diplomatic compromises. Um, um, so I think there's, 
you know, I, there's a, one has to approach this in a nuanced fashion, which I think is what manifests, is what motivates even Saudi leaders, which is, yes, there's an interest. People do care about Palestinians. People don't care much about Palestinian leader or this or that Palestinian institution. Um, um, and people, uh, you know, what has to recall also Saudi Arabia has a long record of being out in front and offering diplomatic solutions um, to the to this conflict. And there's a desire to validate those decades of of diplomatic efforts. So the Saudis are not going to want to run away from the Saudi peace initiative, even if they're not going to insist on its implementation either. They want to validate their historic, what they view as their historic leadership on this issue, um, while all while all the while, you know, they're not going to insist on what the terms of that original peace initiative um, held. Okay, now there is a question from uh, a poster by the name of Eric that talked about, uh, says that Biden campaigned uh, saying that MBS is a pariah and he wanted to make him a pariah, if I remember the, the phrasing. And he's also been establishing relationships with Iran. Can the, the Biden administration actually play a role in, given the things that Joseph Biden, Joe Biden has said about MBS, can he actually play a role as a broker in this deal? Um, it's essential, without which there will be no deal. Um, uh, and I don't mean that, um, uh, uh, I mean that in multiple ways. This is an inherently American deal with each of the parties. It's certainly an American deal with Saudi Arabia. What the Saudis want most of all, we provide. Yes, the Israelis will provide greater access to et cetera. They provide a lot of that, even without a deal. The real benefits will be coming from the United States. Secondly, um, uh, uh, Lindsey Graham had a very important insight uh, that he relayed to the Saudi leadership on a recent trip, which is um, uh, uh, this Republican senator from South Carolina urged the Saudis, do a deal with Joe Biden. That's because your um, uh, the largest number of skeptics and critics of Saudi Arabia in the United States Senate are on the left. It's a Democratic president who can bring along um, the vast number of those critics to accept a deal. A Republican president, much, much more difficult to bring along those critics and, and enough votes to get um, uh, a deal through and, to, and with, with all the, con the, the controversial elements that I outlined earlier. That was Lindsey Graham's advice. It's the right advice. And to the extent of my knowledge, it's advice the Saudis are, um, appreciate, understand, and are heeding. A Democrat can get this deal through a lot more successfully than a Republican is likely to be able to get this deal through. Okay, I think we got time for one more question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, they talk about the, the, the Saudis wish to uh, enrich uranium themselves rather than buying it from another source like maybe South Korea. Uh, you know, you know wh wh why is it, you know, what what's the, the upside if, if we do allow them to uh, enrich their own uranium. What, what what are the assurances that we won't have uh, an Iranian problem down the road decades from now or a decade from now? Uh, and also, uh, yeah. So why not just tell them to get the uranium from somewhere else? Two thousand and fifteen. I thought it was a bad deal, uh, poorly negotiated. Um, uh, but it happened. And uh, that means that eight years ago, the government of the United States of America um, certified the right of the Islamic Republic of Iran to enrich uranium without um, uh, the sorts of intrusive oversight and uh, American you know, participation um, at every step of the way, which is what is being contemplated with the Saudis. I find it difficult to imagine that we can you know, deprive the Saudis of this right once we've already given it to the Islamic Republic of Iran. And the Saudis want us every step of the way, American guidelines, American inspections, American supervision, 
Um, and we should we should define the terms. It can be for you know a long, long period of time. Their their idea is to create a nuclear Aramco. Yes, eventually they will want to do this totally on their own. Eventually it could be a long time from now. And we should do what we can to put in, lock in, safeguards, oversight, et cetera, that make sure that um, you know, that independence is a long, long time from now. Um, they're gonna do it, they're gonna do it with someone. They're gonna do it with the French, they're gonna do it with the Russians. It's a hell of a lot better, in my view, that they do it with the United States. Okay. Uh, there's one more question from Daniel Pipes. Thank you so much, Rob, for the excellent presentation. Do you sense significant internal opposition in Saudi Arabia to a treaty with Israel? It's a very good question. Um, uh, um, uh, actually, it's a, it, it, it opens up a whole other set of questions. It's very difficult right now to sense internal opposition to anything inside Saudi Arabia. One would think that with some of the, the, the fundamental domestic reforms that one would see a lot more domestic opposition. It's very difficult to find it. It's certainly not in the big cities. You don't see it in Riyadh, Jeddah, elsewhere. It might be out there in the hustings, so to speak. Um, and I think that the, that the view about Israel is, is similar to that. Uh, what we do know is that uh, public opinion polling, including that done by my institute, shows that Saudis today um, support uh, contacts with Israel. This is the question that, that we've asked. Support contacts with Israel, business contacts, sports, culture, at the same level today that Emiratis do. And the Emiratis actually have a peace agreement with Israel. So if the Saudis support it at the same level today, one can infer that they would have an even greater support for that sort of open, peaceful set of relations if it were under the umbrella of a formal um, uh, regional, a formal peace agreement. I want to thank you so much. That was a really wonderful webinar. We've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Satloff, for joining us today. And also, I want to thank the people who attended. For our viewers, please be on the lookout for our weekly webinar offerings email that will come out over the weekend. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.